Hi, everybody. Welcome to our introduction to Romeo and Juliet. This is the week of May 11th. So we're starting a excerpt study, um, an excerpt study of the play. So we're going to be watching the film version, and then we're going to be zooming in to some specific scenes to give you a real sense of um, Shakespeare's language, of the time and place that he was writing in, um, but also how time and place shifts how we stage these kinds of dramas, these classic stories um, of in this case, tragic and thwarted love, um, how that's remade and re-understood in every time and place that it gets presented in. So it's kind of going to be a fun drama unit. You're going to be at one point making some scenes of your own using some digital recording. Um, you're going to be doing some writing, and it's going to be a, a great opportunity to engage with this issue of how do texts change when we put them in different times and places, or even uh, well, different times and places across the, the globe. Um, yeah, so we're going to start off by talking a little bit about the culture that it comes from. So to do that, the first thing you're going to do this week is to open up the slideshow for Romeo and Juliet. And I'm going to ask that you have the slides open um, and nearby as you're going through the work this week. Um, so this is the title page for online learning. The first thing I put in here for you folks is a copy of different links that I found really helpful in my study of Shakespeare generally, but then also some specific ones to Romeo and Juliet. So the first is the, the version of the play that I'll be referring to in film a lot, which is the 2013 more recent film edition of the play. Um, if you have the Leonardo DiCaprio version, that's the older version. It's fantastic and really well done, but we're actually going to be using a newer version than that. There's also a 2009 Globe live stage version. So the Romeo and Juliet here, it's done a little tiny bit more contemporary, but still very much in sort of Shakespeare's time. Um, the stage play is also done very traditionally, um, but you can view the, the actual Globe Theatre in London putting on a presentation of Romeo and Juliet. It's a good one as well. Um, we're going to be looking at different tools for context. So Shakespeare's Globe, this famous theatre in London where Shakespeare actually worked at both as an actor and writing for the stage. Um, you can tour it. You can actually go on a digital virtual reality tour of the place. So that's one place I'm going to encourage you to take a look at if you have extra time as an, as an enrichment activity. It has cool stuff on like how did, how did they do stage fighting? How did they do um, special effects back in the day? So if any of you are in technical theater and, and drama, you might really like that site. Um, this week, you're going to be writers. You're going to be writing a sonnet. And it's a very famous form that Shakespeare used to um, both get in with the people in power, so both kind of like get good relationships with people who could help him out, but also um, that he used to write to people that he really loved. And so we're going to write a sonnet this week. Um, it could be serious, could be heartfelt. Um, it's going to be up to you once we review how to study that form. And you'll notice that in the first 30 minutes that we watch of the play this week, um, there is actually a hidden sonnet in the little meet cute that happens on the screen. So um, apart from those tools, the one you're going to be using probably the most is No Fear Shakespeare. That's this bottom one down here. Um, that's a parallel translation of the play. So there's the original, like older sounding English, but then right next to it on the same screen on the internet is a translation in regular speech for us. So you can really easily tell what the main idea is. The only trick is you have to also be aware of what's lost in translation. So it might sound really familiar to read it in a regular language, but then some of the fancy poetry, some of the symbolism might get kind of washed away as it's tried to be made very simple for us. So um, keep that in mind because you're going to be looking back and forth and doing some work with tiny excerpts from the play. Okay, lit charts and, and spark notes. I'm going to show you that in a future video. Um, so in the unit, there's going to be four major assessments that will help to contribute to your skill building and that you'll also get marks for that will help you to raise that average up in English 10-1 or English 10-IB. Um, we're doing similar tracks for this unit. Um, the first thing is this first week's sonnet. So this the silver lining sonnet, I'm going to get you to compose a sonnet that has like a We'll twist at the end, um, and that's going to be the first project. The second one's a masks project, where you're going to be like making a symbolically decorated 
mask for a character of your choice in the play. I'll, you'll get more directions about that in week number two. Week three, you're going to be doing um, either a video scene challenge or starting to talk, talk through some critical writing about the play. Um, I, we may switch this, the essay and the video, I'm not sure yet, but week three is going to be one of those two projects, either a kind of a options to do some video scene work or um, a critical essay writing task. And that's really going to be how we wrap Romeo and Juliet. It'll probably take us about five of the weeks that are remaining if not six of the weeks that are remaining and then we'll have like a final week together to do some discussion groups and and that kind of thing with um with what you've read so far this year okay um so week one let's just talk this week you have three hours of english time how are you going to use them well about 20 to 30 minutes are going to be in this video here and so you're going to be watching this introduction to the play this introduction to our unit and um and then starting to prep and think ahead about your viewing for the week and writing this sonnet so my suggestion is that you spend this first 30 minutes actually listen to the full video um, on Shakespeare's background, then 10 minutes, complete this little previewing guide that's in your course packs in your Romeo and Juliet booklets. Um, and I'll talk about that. Actually, maybe I'll just quickly show it to you. Page, this is a booklet that you'll be getting this week online. And um, page three, page two has like a character map. So if you ever forget who's who, that's your big help is like a little cheat sheet here. Um, the other thing that you can check out on here, like the goals for the unit. So so we're going to be analyzing drama as drama, like I said already. Um, and you're going to be working collaboratively in some, with some scene projects and some peer feedback on your essays, um, experimenting with strategies to really connect both in scene work and also in your own um, in your own essay writing. So there's this is for your kind of your notes, especially so you can keep it for next year. Um, but it has the same outline I'm sharing with you right now. This is the anticipation guide. So it'll take you about 10 minutes and it asks you to think about these questions like or these statements like love at first sight is not only possible but likely. And then to take a stand on it to at the beginning of the play say do we agree? Capital A um, in a strong way. Do we kind of agree? And that's a small A. Do we disagree, which is like, yeah, I kind of don't agree with that. Um, then the small d, you write it down in this spot. And then a, a big d is like, no, absolutely not. I totally disagree with this idea. Um, so go through the, the bolded sentences. And your job is to take a stand. The idea is that when we finish our study in the play, you're going to be able to return to this page and fill out these lines. For right now, you're just taking a quick read through giving your gut instinct feeling and then moving forward with that um, with your with your other work okay um, so going back into the slides that's that 10 minutes of anticipation guide that you see me talking about there um, what I'd like you to do after you've done that little bit of reacting to statements is to watch 31 minutes of the play itself this takes you through um, like Romeo first talking about who he he's kind of fallen in love with this woman named Rosaline, and you find out pff, he's not really in love with her, right? He's just kind of got a surface attraction. Um, you, you see these two families being set up in opposition, the Capulets and the Montagues. So you learn a little bit about their background. You meet Juliet's parents. So you get a sense of how she kind of interacts, what pressures she's under. And then you get the moment where they actually meet. Um, it's a beautiful little scene where they have like a back and forth, a little meet cute in rom-com terms. Um, and so in order to kind of really make the most of that viewing, I'm gonna get you to zoom in to two bits. One is to the meet cute scene that's actually a hidden little sonnet, it's like a little Easter egg. Um, it's a secret sonnet that Shakespeare like stuck in there. Um, and the other part is to reread a little scene that helps you to understand how Romeo's love for Rosalind is different at the beginning. So like um, that little zoom in scene, if you click on the link and read the No Fear Shakespeare, I'm going to ask you to, to find some quotes in your course pack here and write out what do you find out about Romeo at the start of the story from those sets of lines. This is like a 20 minute activity where you're finding some backup about what Romeo thinks and what other people, um, how other people like respond or what's normal, what we normally associate with uh, with that with that topic. So in other words, if somebody says, what sadness lengthens Romeo's hours and Romeo responds, not having that which having makes them short, well, Romeo's like, I don't have the thing. And so time passes like way more slowly. Usually you'd think that ab absence of love would make the heart grow fonder, that it would like make you really savor it. But um, it doesn't seem like it's not having 
the thing that he wants. It's actually making time kind of um, be annoying to him. So um, it's finding a quote about love and then seeing what Romeo thinks and putting that in your own words and then seeing what other people um, kind of say in the scene or see what the co the common wisdom would be. Um, that's a little bit of a challenge, so it, try it out. Um, and then we'll talk together about that in our meet if you have any questions. Um, and then after that, we're really going to be taking a look at sonnets in particular. I'm gonna encourage you to, after you've watched the play, after you've done the quote work, to review the slides 20 to 22 and, and a little video that walks you through iambic pentameter. And once you've done those two things, you're ready to spend about an hour um, of writing time writing your own sonnet. And um, yeah, so you can spread this section stuff out for the week. I know it seems like there's lots to do, but they're actually really short little activities or little tidbit activities. So there's like half an hour here, half an hour there. Um, you can do it all in one chunk during our regular scheduled class time, but you can also decide to space this out a little bit. And I would say there's kind of one chunk of prep work. There's one chunk of viewing <laughs> and there's one chunk of kind of doing some quote hunt stuff and one chunk of writing. So there's like a, about three to four little chunks that you can spread out in your week if you feel like you, you don't want to do all the Shakespeare stuff at once, okay? Um, and that, 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 believe it or not, adds up to three hours of English work, which is what you do in, in your semester classes, a little bit less actually. Um, so that's your job for this week. So by the end of the week, you'll have watched a bit of the play, and you'll have written your own kind of Shakespeare-y uh, sonnet form. Um, so I'm really excited to kind of just spend 10 minutes talking to you a little bit about Shakespeare's world because I think it'll help inform your watching of the play and it also help you see why it's so important that we're, we're making emphasis on you being writers and actors, even though we have this weird social distancing thing going on. Um, I, we want you to experience Shakespeare as something that's alive. It's like a lived space. And so by writing the way that he wrote, uh, by making a scene, in your own context and figuring out how would I deliver like a set of lines that will really help you to kind of get the sense of drama of what it means to be a, a playwright and what it means to be an actor on the stage a, in a little bit right um so what do you already associate with Shakespearean drama I'm sure you already have heard of Romeo and Juliet that you know stuff about it and before you get into it too deeply it's good to think about well like why the heck am I doing this Shakespeare study I've heard of this guy it feels really old why do it um, here's my why, you're going to have your own why. And maybe your why is, it's in the curriculum, I have to do it. Fair enough. Um, you know, I, my job isn't to make you go, oh, Shakespeare, uh, but instead uh, to really understand the power of his language and expose you to a different time and place than our own. So um, I really, I, I, I still think Shakespeare is, even though it's required, I would still teach it even if it wasn't, because I think that what he does is, dis is distill poetry. He gives you the most in the fewest possible words. And I know it might not seem that way when you're reading the play, it might seem like he's going on and on, but the way that Shakespeare uses images in particular and symbols um, is special uh, because to me, it's because he's responding to what was right in front of him, which is an audience. He's responding to the audience of his day. And the audience of his day was special. It was a mixed audience that he had to keep connected with him, whether they were educated or whether they were part of the groundling crew who was standing for his plays and like selling stuff out of the back alley of the theater. Um, so his stories have this cultural power because he had to kind of appeal to people from a whole range of human living in his own day. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, from a pragmatic level, you'll hear lots of people go, oh, Shakespeare, because he did um, use a lot of words for the first time in sort of English. Um, and so he's credited with creating words. Actually, this is just him fitting stuff into the lines. So yes, he might be the first, first person to say critical as an adjective, but critic might have already been used in English. So he did kind of invent some words. He's really famously talked about that way that like Shakespeare used about 21,000 different words in his, in his um, vocabulary overall and about 10,000 um, in each play. If it ever feels overwhelming, that's normal because guess what? You and I walking around, yeah, we have a vocabulary of about 10,000 words, but we only ever use about 2,000 a day, like max. <laughs> so if to all of a sudden get all of these words thrown at us, that's 
that's common feeling because Shakespeare did use a lot of different vocabulary. Um, he also coined some idioms, which we still use, like housekeeping or method and madness. Those come from his plays. So that's kind of a cool thing to check out. Um, and he was really famous for writing funny insults. And so um, like, I challenge you to a bat of wits, but I see <laughs> you are unarmed. He makes lots of jokes like that where it's like, taking it a little bit, throwing a little bit of shade, we would say, at um, at people on the stage. But um, there's a little optional insult activity in your course pack. It's not required, but it's some it's some fun with old fashioned insults if you want to make a few. Um, more importantly, this mixed audience that I want you to know about. Um, there were nobles who sat in the upper part of this theater so you can look at the upper balconies they got special chairs they they paid extra for cushions and they sat through his plays yeah and it was a very um poetic language so they loved it and shakespeare would uh, make commentary about the politics of his time kind of like um you know you might have seen the patriot act um uh, with his son or um you know there's also a guy named stephen colbert or um john oliver these kind of political commentators um Shakespeare did a bit of that in his plays, but um, he also put in like body, and I mean like both gross, like disgusting, and also like body, like physical body humor, like fart jokes and that kind of thing. Um, so sex, sexuality um, and body humor was a part of what he put in too, because he was trying to appeal not just to the fancy educated people, but also to people who wandered in off the street and only paid like part of a penny to get into his play. Um, and so he had to keep their attention. And so there's a mixture of that stuff in his in his work. Um, the other thing I want you to kind of know leaving this unit is that Elizabethans, so that was the time period where Shakespeare lived, they really, really liked things to be like seen and talked about in terms of order. So that it was really important to them to like order the universe, to recognize a religious order that like had man down here and like the Christian God up here, um, you know, angels and demons and things in that belief system just below God and, and so on and so forth. And like king above noble, above peasant. It was really important for them to have that in place and be talked about as a good thing. And here's the reason why. Just before Shakespeare was around, just before Elizabeth I um, took the crown, there had been um, generations of civil war, like huge amounts of civil war and conflict that had only really calmed down um, with Elizabeth's grandfather. And so he was Henry Tudor. Um, Henry VIII, her dad, um, the famous king with all the wives, he was the one who like, really secured it, made it calm, but he also disrupted things because there was not only civil conflict, but in Henry VIII's time, you know about the wives, there was lots of change over in, in the stability of the monarchy. And there was a lot of change in religion from Catholic to Protestant, and then under um, somebody else, England became Catholic, and then under Elizabeth became Protestant. So there's a lot of flipping over of the state religion. Um, all of that meant that for Elizabethans, oh, they wanted order, they wanted it to be simple, they wanted it to be feeling secure. So when things come along that mess with that order, um, there's a lot of talk in Shakespeare's plays about fate. There's a lot of talk in Romeo and Juliet about fate and how much is in the stars, how much is controlled by the scientific world around us. Um, there's a, there's an interest in discovering the boundaries of the of the geographic world. So there's um, a lot of uh, motion and, and exploration around the world um, in this time and um, colonization at this time. Now we know that also has very um, dangerous and sometimes um, like sometimes profitable, but for the for the people going overseas to to get resources, but sometimes devastating for the people already living in those lands. Um, consequences. So there's a lot going on here, but basically takeaways, there's been a lot of chaos. So Elizabethans shook, love order, but they also realize that, man, choice is a good thing. So too much order and people feel trapped. There might be tragic consequences. But if you don't pay attention to the order, if you act too quickly, or if you don't take advice from people, if you're not kind of moderate in what you do, you mess up that order and things can get really scary really quickly. And so keep that in mind, the order and chaos and how much of what we are is already decided um, because that's going to come up in our play a lot. Um, the last context thing I just draw your attention to is the structure of the lines themselves. So the fact that they like this order, it means you got to pay attention to order when you read this work. 
Shakespeare's going to use regular, not fancy speech to, to be um, showing the difference between the upper and the lower classes. So people who speak in just regular talk without poetry and rhyming and all that beautiful stuff, um, in regular talk, it's gonna be for like poor people, it's gonna be for people who have lost control and are mad, sometimes um, uh, to create comedic effects or like a back and forth, but usually it's for lower classes. That means that verse is usually upper classes or times when the emotions just rise um, or times of incredibly uh, beautiful imagination moments. So um, kind of be aware of that distinction going forward in your study, especially if you're in the IB section of 10-1, because the way that the author is choosing to change around how different patterns work in their piece is a really important authorial choice. And that language of authorial choice is really important in the IB program. We talk a lot about that and how there is an author choosing something and then an audience feeling an, and having an impact on the audience. Um, yeah, so I think that pretty much covers most of the history. Um, now in terms of sonnets, why am I getting you to write a sonnet? Because that's what Shakespeare had to do. At the time, the way you got good social standing was to have a patron who like helped you with the dollar dollars, dollar dollars, helped you with funds, helped you with, um, sometimes they got like patents, in other words, like copyrights or licenses. Um, sometimes you got gifts, like property, or like you're allowed to have the Globe Theater as your place to do theater. Um, so it was really important to have like people in power like you and support you as an artist. Kind of like the old-fashioned GoFundMe, but not, um, but more elite. Like, so in other words, people could ask for help, and then it was the people in power who funded, not crowdsource funding. So that's um, so that's kind of courtly love. Oftentimes, poets use sonnets to show the people in power, "Oh, hey, I'm a good artist. Look at me as a writer. You should support me." That kind of a thing, kind of like a YouTube star. Um, and so iambic pentameter was this structure that showed you were educated and that showed you knew what you were doing. And this is the heartbeat of Shakespeare. So the very last thing I'm going to talk to you about is, is this heartbeat. It's especially important for 10 IBs. For folks in the regular 10 course, this is the part of the video that's maybe enrichment. So if you want to go off and watch the Romeo and Juliet and start into your week's work, you can do that. This next bit, this next five minutes or so, is me talking about a very specific form, but it's, it's interesting, so you're welcome to hang around. So I am a pentameter. Uh, people always tell me my chest gets, uh, like my, my throat gets red because I, I thump it a little bit during this lecture. But um, iambic pentameter is fancy word for the heartbeat of Shakespeare because the lines are going to have the rhythm that we'd expect of a heartbeat. Da dum, da dum, da dum, da dum, da dum, da dum. Da -dum. I'm not sure if you can hear it, but the softer beat comes first. Da dum. And the heavier beat comes second. Da dum, da dum, da dum. Kind of sounds like Dr. Seuss, right? I do not like green eggs and ham. I do not like them, Sam. I am. Okay? Uh, this is weird because, believe it or not, a lot of our speech, if you're an English speaker, like when you're speaking English and it's your first language, um, a lot of our speech tends to develop in patterns that are similar to iambic pentameter. It would sound really weird if I started to t speak to you with my emphasis on the wrong syllable, right? My emphasis is on the wrong syllable. You'd be like, what? We're used to rhythm and hearing rhythm with a bit of an iambic bend, so emphasis on the syllable, syllable. So the heartbeat do 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 is um is famous for being uh one of the ways shakespeare kind of communicates so if you listen to this famous line from the balcony scene in romeo and juliet you'll hear the the heartbeat but soft what light through yonder window breaks it is the east so but soft what light from yonder window breaks is Romeo going, oh my goodness, I see Juliet's face and it's the sunshine that lights up my world. Um, same thing in the sonnet that's very famous. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate, right? Oh, I can't compare you to summer, you're even better. Um, so shall I compare thee to? Um, it has that heartbeat in it.
Um, there's a great video if you want to find out a little bit more and visualize this rhythm. And I'm going to encourage you to, if you, um, if you do nothing else, to listen to Sonnet 130, which is Stephen Fry reading this funny, funny sonnet. Um, it's basically got three little sections. All sonnets do. They're like A, B, A, B. They have some rhyming lines in that order. The A line rhymes with the A line, right? So A, B, A, B. Then C, D, C, D. There's another little stanza. And then uh, A, B, C, A, B. C, D, E, F, um, and then a final GG couplet. What Stephen Fry does with Sonnet 130 is hilarious. Um, it's basically a sonnet where Shakespeare's describing the love of his life as this ogre of a woman, okay? Like, we're talking Fiona, Princess Fiona, but on a bad, bad day. So he talks about how his love is, like, not this traditional beauty, like, on the left, but is this really ugly woman who just, like, treads and stomps and has this, like, horrid face and hair, and it's horrible. It's a mess. Um, so it's a weird thing because he's writing this love sonnet, and it's the worst Hallmark card ever. But at the very end, there's this little little couplet, this GG, like, rhyme scheme, a little last two lines that turns it and makes this whole thing um, just a silver lining and makes her seem wonderful because he says, hey, I'd rather describe her this way, she's beautiful like this, compared to all your ladies who, you know, you're, you've lied about. Like, I'm being honest about how about this woman, and my love outshines all of those false, kind of supposedly beautiful ladies. So it's worth, it's worth listening to, because it's quite a funny sonnet. Um, you can check that out. Um, and the bigger part this week, you're going to be seeing a sonnet form um, in this little section of Romeo and Juliet where they first meet. So you're going to see Romeo and Juliet banter back and forth and they're going to use the image of um, a pilgrim, so like a person who wants to uh, visit a holy place, the, a pilgrim visiting a shrine or like a, a, like a holy saint's relic and you're going to hear Romeo and Juliet match wits kind of do some back and forth flirtation um, in this little sonnet. It's very famous. So enjoy that little section of the film. Um, and I hope that you enjoy the challenge of writing your own sonnet. Um, it's required to write like 14 lines and to try the rhyme scheme. It is a bonus, but one I expect of IB students uh, to try and at least a couple places use iambic pentameter. Shakespeare would usually use iambic throughout and then maybe break the rule once or once in a while deliberately. But, um, you know, try if you can um, to use the for sure the 10 syllables. So 10 little parts that you um, hear the subdivision of words in a line. Um, and if you can do it iambic, all the more um, credit to you and good job and uh, yeah and this is a minor assignment so I hope you have fun making it. Um, we're going to stop there because that's the last bit for this week and um, really if you have any questions as always please make sure that you're getting in touch with me via email. Um, I'm going to be marking your research projects this week obviously so thank you for the hard work that you already did on those um, and thank you for handing them in on Friday. Uh, I can't wait to give you feedback on them and this week I hope you have a good, a good week listening to this video and doing some um, work with Romeo and Juliet starting into the film. Okay take care, thank you very much and have a great week. Bye.